So, so I'm uh, Vicki Schickhardt, and I'm with the Geological Survey of Canada, and I'm trained as a geophysicist traditionally, but I'm trying to learn more geology, so I'm going to be talking about some of my attempts to make sense of geophysics and pretend it actually means something. So regional geophysical data sets at a variety of scales and resolutions are increasingly available over most of Canada. And I'm with Natural Resources Canada, so under our program, such as the Geomapping for Energy and Minerals, which is one of our regional mapping projects that are trying to map areas that have never been mapped in the Arctic before. Our Targeted Geoscience Initiative program, which is more focused on specific mineral deposits. And the UNCLOS pro program, which is looking at the continental margins, figuring out what actually belongs to Canada. We acquire these geophysical data sets to support these research projects, which means that each year, high quality, modern geophysical data sets are increasingly available, and we use these data sets to support the mapping projects and assess the resource potential of these big areas of land. So within Canada, we have our geoscience data repository, which is where we distribute all our geophysical data sets. And it's actually within our mandate within the government to provide these pro or products for all of Canada. And you can get them through the GDR website. And this includes map images, publications, geochemistry, geochronology, all sorts of products. And coming, I was supposed to be ready this week, but it's not ready yet. Soon we'll be having a geological maps available for all of Canada that you'll be able to download, much like the province's interactive maps that they have. So the, GD, the GDR allows you to discover and evaluate these data sets. So you can get it through the Seek Data and Geosoft, as well as an ArcGIS or MapInfo plugin, or through the GDR website. And it's really nice because you can, for the GDR website, you can search specific NTS sheets and grab all the data we have there. You can search by zooming in on the map and grab the data that way, or to enter specific geographic coordinates and see all the data that's available within that block. So within this database, we have the Canadian Gravity Anomaly Database, and this includes all the gravity stations the Canadian government has taken since the 1940s, which is over 700,000 observations. So the data spacing ranges from 200 meters for targeted transects in very strategic locations, to 20 kilometers for the reconnaissance, reconnaissance scale, first order geological problems. From these data bases, we have a two kilometer Bouguer, Friere, and isostatic residual grids, and the first vertical derivative of the Bouguer gravity available for all of Canada, as well as the individual point data set, the, the individual data points. In the Canadian Aeromagnetic Database, we have all the regional aeromagnetic data that the Government of Canada has flown from the 1940s also to the present. And this is over 12 million line kilometers with surveys ranging from 200 meters to 1600 meters. And as you can see, it's covering most of Canada. And this is over 600 surveys. And the products we have from this is a 200 meter national grid and a, of the residual total field and the first vertical derivative, as well as for the more recent surveys where we have digital files, the survey data themselves, which includes the profile and gridded data, and the survey specs. And each year we're flying new surveys to upgrade the coverage or infill existing areas. So last year, I think we flew, oops, we flew this block last year and we're flying some new blocks this year. So each year, the coverage is increasing and more of Canada will be covered. And once the data is made public, it goes immediately on the data set or the database and for the public to access. We also have our National Air Airborne Radiometric Database, which started in the 70s with the very broad line-spaced surveys that were flown for the, by the Skyband for the reconnaissance reconnaissance scale missions. And this is over 360 surveys with spacings as tight as 200 meters. And the products we currently have available for this are the 250 meter potassium, uranium, thorium, and total crown grids, 
And like the aeromagnetic data, the recent survey profile and gridded data is available and you can download the, the survey data itself. We've, uh, this is, raw property information is one of our newest add-ons to the, the DAP server, and this was started because one of our ex-GSC people, retirees, Matt Salisbury, had a lot of acoustic property measurements that people were interested in, and we had no way to distribute this data. And we had all the, when they did the regional gravity surveying in the 70s and 80s, they took density measurements with every gravity station. So we have over 16,000 density measurements that were just sitting in a spreadsheet in someone's office that we decided to make public. And then we're soliciting within our scientists to get people to contribute their data sets. A lot of the geologists who go into the field take rock property will take magnetic susceptibility information. And our new mechanism for capturing that information, the Ganfeld tablet, means that all this data is becoming digital, so you have a rock type, a magnetic susceptibility information, and geographic information associated with it. So within the Geological Survey of Canada, we use the airborne surveys. Magnetics is mostly what we'll use for bedrock mapping projects. And the radiometrics will occasionally get flown with the mag for radon detection, uranium exploration, mineral alteration. I don't believe they've flown a radiometric survey since 2010 in the Thelon Basin. That was the most recent one. And then electromagnetic. We've flown a couple EM surveys in, previous, in recent years, so we're hoping to do more of them. And we use this for geological mapping, mineral potential, exploration targeting, and sometimes we'll fly it for specific areas if there's interest from the territory or partners, Aboriginal associations within the area. And then we have not flown a lot of airborne gravity, but we would do this to solve first order geological problems. So we use these regional geophysical data sets to, um, when used with geological information, these regional geophysical data sets help answer these questions about the tectonic framework, geology, and structure. And these public data sets are especially useful in the remote areas of Canada, such as north of 60, where it is, can be very costly and very difficult to explore, and we want to get a left hand on what's going on before we start our boots on the ground mapping. And these remote regions have sparse geological information, but ample geophysical coverage. So we can link the geological data that we do have to the geophysical signatures and extrapolate. And at the end of the day, it's about making most of your situation. You need to know what the geological problem that you're trying to solve is, assess what is publicly available, the scale of the problem, and the accuracy and resolution needed to get something meaningful, geologically meaningful from your data. So in my presentation, I'm going to be talking about three case studies that I did as part of my PhD and some recent work I've done with the, the GSC working in their GEM2 program, which is uh, trying to map areas that haven't been mapped or that have some potential. We essentially made the very lofty promise of mapping all of Canada's Arctic, and we're doing our best to get that done. So what can we do to get the most out of these publicly available data sets before we go to the field? Or even after we go to the field to enhance your geological interpretation with the geophysics. So the first area I'm going to talk about is the Tahari Lake Wager Bay area in Nunavut. <coughs> And it was one of the four regions in the Ray province that had very little historical exploration. There was some reconnaissance mapping done in the 50s to get, which essentially said that everything was granite, and then some more detailed studies for a national park that's near there, as well as the Daly Bay complex. And then recently there's been more remote predictive mapping and some dating that was done in the early 2000s. And then following the end of GEM1, we had a program called Geomapping Frontiers, which essentially went to several areas to see where GEM2 should be. And we noticed some mineral potential in this area. 
So it was selected as an area to follow up in Gem 2. And then there was two field size seasons in 2015 and 2016 of eight week summer eight bedrock mapping field seasons that were completed and there'll be some detailed follow up work next year for one of the geologists that's working on our PhD in the area. And part of the GEM mandate are these fundamental questions that we're trying to answer by going to these areas. So for the Ray and working in this area, it's what is the orogenic architecture of the Ray province and how is this going to control the distribution of mineral resources? So on the right is the geological map that was produced following the remote predictive mapping in the 2000s, and this is before people had done any systematic mapping projects. And as you can see, it's pretty, it's pretty pink. The blue are panels of supercrustal rocks, and the bright pink are the 1.83 Hudson granite and Martel cyanite intrusions. And then transecting the northern margins of the study area are the Chesterfield Fault Zone and the Wager Bay Shear Zone, both of which are really big structures that are poorly understood, and we don't really know a lot about them or what, what they even mean. So geophysically, the data is really has a nice situation because we've got the, both prior to the field programs, we were able to fly a 400 meter lines placed aeromagnetic survey and I stitch it to the regional data so we have full coverage over this area as well as 10 to 15 kilometer ground gravity data that was acquired back in the 80s and then I was in the field in this location this summer and I did two long gravity transects across the Wager Bay and Chesterfield shear zones to get an idea of the shallow crustal structure because there wasn't a lot of exposure at the surface and then in the field, I took, I was, I went, I hounded the geologists and got the density and magnetic susceptibility measure information on a lot of their samples. So this is the preliminary geological map that was produced after this field season this year, and it's already a lot more detailed than the previous one. You have mafic and ultramafic intrusions that were located from the mag that they picked up. The supercrustal belt sequence has extended, which has also been located by the mag. The mag really nicely defines the, the folded belt, and from the rock property information, I was able to correlate it to a meta iron stone unit within the supercrustal sequence that was causing the anomalies. And the mags also really help for there's a magmatitic basement here, which is somewhat, it has lineaments within it, but it's a very different texture than the Archean supercrustals, so it's good for distinguishing the two of them. And the supercrustals are especially important because of the, the, the potential for base and precious metals that we identified in this initial 2012 fieldwork, and we've been trying to follow up with detailed stream sediment sampling in the past field seasons. And the geophysics has also been good for helping with solving geological problems. That the geologists come to me with a question, and I say, how can I help you with this? So one of their questions was these two, I don't know, if, these two granite packages here. It's a 2.6 a uh, billion year old snow island suite and it's, they're dated at the same age but geophysically they look very different and there's some stuff going on that the geologist wasn't really sure what was happening. The southern one is oriented differently than the main strike of the area than most of the other stuff on the map and the, the magnetic texture and then they, they found a myelinite zone under one of the bodies so they we're trying to put it together. And so I suggested, oh, we can see the basement underneath of it. Maybe we could do some source edge detection techniques to figure out, is this a sheet? Is this different than the northern body? So I did a Euler deconvolution spy, and then I played around with some forward modeling to get an idea of how the, it, by varying the magnetic susceptibility and the thickness of the body, how that affected what you were seeing 
on the residual total field, and we found that the southern body was actually a sheet, and that explained that the the myelinized cork the the uh, myelinite zones that the geologists were seeing, and explained why it wasn't oriented the same as everything else. And the geologists, from looking, from working with the geophysicists, were able to put together a model of what could have happened. And this is uh, was neat because it was I had seen similar sheets of this Snow Island Suite further west of the area, and it was we had we got to see it two places, and it kind of. It makes sense, so now we're trying to figure out where these sheets are coming from. The second, the second thing I helped with with this project is uh, looking at the regional gravity data to kind of get the bigger picture, taking a step back and seeing if we can see anything here. So the first thing we noticed was the wager bay shear zone was uh, it's a magnetic anomaly on the mag map and a gravity anomaly on the gravity map, and we had these co-located anomalies that if they were in the gravity, they were big features that are located at depth. Whereas at surface, all the bedrock mappers were able to see were fresh, unaltered, and undeformed granite. So the geologists started to think that maybe these unaltered granites had come up along the wage of a shear zone, and that was why it looked different. And as well, the, to the south of the study area, there's two notable gravity anomalies. The Daly Bay Complex, which has been pretty well studied. They did a lot of modeling on it in the, in the 90s, where they took over 300 rock property measurements of density and did detailed structural mapping and were able to get a, some 3D modeling results of it. And then the bedrock mappers that in this area started finding charnakite in, their, in the field, and they did not expect to find that at all in this area. And we sat back and looked together and found this big gravity anomaly that's there, which may be why they have granulite facies rocks at surface. There's something going around, going on at depth. So I did some preliminary 3D modeling for them using the Voxy system to kind of get an idea of if it's telling us anything at all. So the Daily Bay, this is the modeling that was done at Daily Bay, which is before 3D modeling, as I know it at least. And it suggested that it's an inward dipping body that was in place from northward directed thrusting. And there's a similar thrust body that isn't in this area, but is over here, with a similar geophysical response to the Daily Bay complex. The Como Lake is different. The, the anomalies are located below surface, which makes sense with what the geologies were seeing because there was no real difference in the rocks over the Como Lake domain versus the just generic Archean basement. And the anomaly was extending outwards at depth. And one of the, I was talking to a, the geologist doing her PhD in this area last week, and she said that she's doing the metamorphic petrology and that they have a decreasing metamorphic grade towards the Chesterfield Fault Zone. And uh, they're wondering if this could be a metamorphic core complex that's accounting for this. And then the Chesterfield Fault Zones and the Wager Shear Zones were accommodating for the moving crustal blocks. So the second case study I'm going to talk about is I did my PhD thesis in this area. And it's, uh, so it was extensively studied in Gem 1 for the Nuclear Energy for Canada program, and the Southwest Delon Basin is currently being studied in GEM2 through the South Ray project. And the Delon Basin is structurally and tectonically similar to the Athabasca Basin. Both host uranium deposits. And the Thelon is a thousand meters of sedimentary sandstone and conglomerates that overlie paleoproterozoic supercrustal belts that underlie the central axis of the basin. Archean basin, basement, that transect it. There are some shear zones that cut the basin that aren't, you can't necessarily see them at the geology. And uh, there's 1.83 uh, Hudson granite and Martell cyanide that intrude the south eastern margins, and then 1.76 New Alton granite that variably intrude the whole area. 
So because it's covered, they need a geophysicist to understand the subsurface geology below the felon. So the uranium deposit, the felon, we care about the felon, or we care about the felon, was that it is host to a number of uranium deposits, such as the Kigavik and Andrew Lake. And they're all focused a lot in these Archean and Paleoproterozoic rocks on the southwestern, southeastern margins of the basin that are cross-cut by east-west faults that are expressed as magnetic lows. And they're, and they're heavily altered. And they're along a northwest or northeast-southwest structural corridor. So we wanted to see if we can take this information, what we know about the Kigavik area, and try to figure out, can we apply this within the Phelan Basin? Can this tell us something? Are we going to find more potential? Is there other places we could look within the Phelan? So over the Northeast Phelan Basin, unlike the Athabasca, the Northeast Phelan Basin is a lot more remote. There is less data. There, most of the companies are just operating outside of the basement or outside of the basin, and a lot of this stuff hasn't made public. And because the Thelon is so regional, and I'm looking at such a big picture area, I'm not looking for, or we're not going to try to find direct detection of deposits. We're trying to develop a geological, geophysical model that'll identify prospective areas. So making the geology work underneath the sedimentary cover. So this means intersecting reactivated faults in fertile basement units. So the data available for the area are, we had a letter or a consortium of companies operating the area, donated their data sets to the GSC, and in turn we flew the, flew the gaps to cover the majority of the base. And then we didn't fly here because there's a game sanctuary. And this included three of the 400 meter space lines that were merged with 200 to 300 meter space or industry lines. As well, during the 70s, there was seismic refraction surveys through all of the Thelon, so we were able to take the acoustic properties from those seismic reflection and get an idea of depth in some areas, as well as I did two field seasons here, and again, how did the geologists to get density and magnetic susceptibility on all of this rock, so I think I ended up with over a, a thousand rock property information in this area, so it was really good for constraining how the, geo, the connection between the geophysics and the geology. So this rock property information provides a fundamental link between the geophysical signature and the geology. So by collecting the rock property information and working with the geologists, we were able to, to identify these key magnetic lithologic units that we'd be looking for underneath the sedimentary cover. So this is the residual total field over the area. And you can begin to start piecing together some things. We have these big circular intrusions. This is the Snow Island Sweet Granite that I modeled earlier. We've got the 1.76 circular intrusions that we have one this area, south of the study area that has any thermal gold mineralization associated with it. Within these paleoproterozoic supercrystal belts, there's key magnetic units that we can extrapolate beneath the basin. So we have a PS3 a magnetic siltstone sequence, as well as a, a highly magnetic basalt. And then because a lot of the, so you have your sediments, you have your paleoprotozoic rocks, and your basin, and all of the residual total field is measuring the sum of all these contributions, we I ran a series of source edge detection routines on the data to try to accentuate the, the edges of the magnetic sources and pick out some of the smaller units that are covered by the sandstone and enhance them so when you're interpolating, it's easier. As well, using the source edge detection maps to do uh, structural interpretation. So looking at the distribution of the folds and folds, knowing these magnetic paleoproterozoic units, looking for offsets in the units, looking at the alteration zone, if there is demagnetization, if you have a fault that truncates a, a magnetic unit, if you can tell the offset direction, which way things are moving. So I tested, I ended up going with, a, for the visualization purposes, a TDX and theta, because the TDX is really good at highlighting edges, and the theta nicely 
enhance the compositional variation. So for over the big Snow Island Sweet Granites, it helped highlight the, the Paleoproterozoic supercrustal rocks that were on top of them. And then from there, I began to pick out areas of similar magnetic lithologic character and start drawing and start drawing some units. And then from kind of making associations, start picking out faults, lineaments, and discontinuities. And then I started to call things things. So seeing that, oh, okay, thing, this looks like the PS2 basalt. We can tell these are the Snow Island sweet intrusions. And trying to big the, put together the bigger picture. And then taking the geological map and extrapolating that down into the basin too. So we have a predictive geological map. And then because of the uranium interest to the south, we looked at which units were perspective potentially would have been fertile host rocks from uranium mineralization. So the faults in yellow are fertile units where faults intersect them. And the red units are these intersecting faults, so perspective areas below the sedimentary cover. And then I tested the magnetic lithologic interpretation with some gravity forward models I completed over the area. And we had a really good correspondence between what I thought the rocks were and when I input the structural and rock property information and what the gravity was telling us. So the final case study I'm going to very quickly talk about is the Montresor belt in Nunavut. So this was visited in the 80s in the regional reconnaissance mapping that the GSC was so good at. And it's a, they thought it was a simple simpline with Paleoproterozoic gray cover overlying Archean basement. We did some follow-up work in gem reconnaissance through the gem frontiers, and we found hydrothermal breccia with anomalous copper, gold, and silver, and this was a style of mineralization that had never before been documented in any of these pillar protozoic belts. So we went back in 2014 to look at the nature of this alteration zone, and then the tectonic setting of the belt. So this belt's a lot further than the other supercrustal belts, and it was further away from the trans-Hudson. So we wanted to see if that could tell us some, some stuff about what was going on. So this is the geological map of the Montresor belt, the Archean basement, and the Paleoproterozoic cover. So the Southwest Montresor belt is a really pretty geophysical anomaly. It's a concentric ovals and the hydrothermal breccia is a mag low that can be traced. There's intersecting faults. So we wanted to do some magnetic forward modeling to figure out if we can get a, like a geometrically at sur below surface what we could get out of this area and I also had rock property information to work with it but because it was a fly camp we were mostly focused in this uh, to this study area so I wasn't able to get a lot of information on the northeastern limb so I did some tricks as a geophysicist does and I started playing with apparent susceptibility calculations to kind of get an idea of what, if I can get a susceptibility information that way. And apparent susceptibility works by assuming that a series of vertical square and prisms of infinite depth extent are what will approximate the magnetic field. So assuming that we have a good idea of the most magnetic units in the area, that geometrically things aren't that different and that there isn't that much glacial overburden because you have depth issues. You, we scaled the apparent susceptibility from as it was calculated to within the known constraints, so zero and then the ma ma maximum susceptibility of the belt. And we were able to get really representative values with what we found with the sampling. The sampling corresponded really well and we found we were able to pick up more detail on the magnetic image, so it essentially acted like uh, a new source, not that we need another, source edge detection map. And we found that the, the non-magnetic zone extended vertically. I could not get it to fit within the conforms, and we, possible reasons for this, if there was a fault that went up through the surface, or if uh, it was the hydrothermal alteration had altered into the sequences below it. And we were able to get a pretty good control of what the geology was there. And the other component of this project was the tectonic setting. So we learned at this mapping that it wasn't just a simple syncline, there was more going on. The lower Montresor belt was 
amphibolite fasces and thrust integrated with the basement, the upper montresor was separated from the lower, that was green, or by late petamor post metamorphic belt, and the upper montresor was green schist fasces. And we found that these distinct magnetic anomalies we're seeing on the map approximated the stratigraphic units. And so we assumed from that then maybe we can get an idea of the structure if we look at these deviations from, a or from the concentric pattern. So I constructed a series of forward models from the magnetic data. And this area was really nice because the flight lines were perpendicular to strike, so I got to work a long line and I was able to get a lot more information from the data and to pick out distinct units. And we found there was two, and we documented a series of low angle faults within the forward modeling. So there was two reasons for the faults. We had the low angle extensional faults similar to the detachment between the upper and lower montresor, as well as piggyback thrust faults, which would be more similar to what you see in a fold and thrust belt. And we went with this as the most likely model just because it accounted for the dip variability we were seeing in the northern limb, where it was much steeper dipping. So we took this information and kind of took a step backward to kind of figure out what this meant with respect to the trans Hudson. So the Montresor seems to be a distal example of trans Hudson de deformation. Similar supercrustal belts, such as the Amur and Kepcha, which are closer to the trans Hudson, are increasingly deformed and at a higher metamorphic grade. And because of the exposure, we wouldn't have been able to get this information without looking at the geophysics. They're just, the geologists couldn't map these features. So in conclusion, interpretations of publicly available data sets provide information that add value to the geologists. And you can use the right geolo geophysical data set to solve the right geological problems. So I'd look at gravity for large scale features and magnetics for the predictive mapping and structural interpretations. And effective geological interpretations, the geophysicists and geologists must work together. I work a lot with the geologists and we both bounced ideas and we try to figure out what works, the geophysical solution working with the geological constraints. And you need, important to consider the geological setting, rock properties, and ore deposit models when analyzing these regional geophysical data sets. And at the end of the day, it's about getting the most out of your data. The Canadian government provides this for you guys to use. And it's a good starting point for more detailed targeted studies. And I had a lot of help from a lot of people, and thank you. What? Go ahead, John. This is an easy one. Yeah. I see this Peter map from you, particularly in Canada. What does that refer to? It's, uh, it's Chris Witten. He did his work. I, I googled this last night. It's the, it's a, I forget the, what it means, but it's a zero and a max and a zero for the source. It's a edge detector. Yeah, it's an edge detector. It's one of the the edge detectors that are up there, but I don't remember mathematically. What it was. Is it is it not the um, the uh, sorry uh, total gradient? I looked this up yesterday, and I, I haven't looked at my piece of stuff in a really long time. We'll, we'll, find, a, we'll find a reference, and we'll stick it in so that you can replicate it. Um, well, one, one thing that Vicky touched on, and physical properties. I had to write that note down. It's been, it seems to be always talked about it. It's seldom done, but you got one season, you got 150 samples, which I think added 2.5% to the entire GSC database, which I thought that was pretty good. We're getting there. <laughs> How many people in the room would actively use in programs physical property information? That's, that's good. I like that. Yeah. We probably aren't very good at getting it filed uh, because a lot of it doesn't seem to end up in assessment routines or in assessment reports, but that's, uh, that's excellent. I guess some of the the, uh, uh, the lack of that often is the cost. People do it on drill core, but as Vicky indicated, like large parts of northern Canada, there's still a lot of outcrop. I mean, Stefan would probably be drooling if he could go into a place that was so much rock, right? 
Well, when you, when you say covered, too, it's often a relatively thin cover. The Thelon exception. Yeah, the Thelon. It's usually like really shallow for burden. So, right. 20 meters of cover. Maximum. Nice. <laughs> can, can I comment about rock properties? We, we, in Australia, we have exactly the same issue. And we know there's a lot out there. There's plenty of sitting in excess spreadsheets on my hard And I think the challenge is, is for someone to take a bull by the horns, like a natural organization. Okay. And then, and say, this is the way we're going to do it as a nation, and and everyone does it the same way, and so we always the same metadata, so you can go and rip it off the web and use it for your own purposes. Property is something that um, is not a publishable thing, right? So most academics who collect um, hand it over. It's, 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 it's just another tool that you use. So, uh, look, I just think that that's the way forward. Our GSI Australia's having a big, long conversation with the surveys about that that works. So you know there's lots of data around, around and we just it's all different formats, different, you know, CVSSI, you know, it's hundreds. Yeah. So, you know, it's, that's the way forward. Someone has to say, if this is the way we're doing it, please do it this way, and then, you know, we'll it this way. Well, I can say you guys figure out and let us know. Yeah. yeah. We're good imitators when it comes to that. Tom. I just want to I just want to add that um, with the reference to the rock property database, uh, <clears throat> about 10 years ago, Mirjai, the geoscience, was supported. Um, they have a, a, a long-term rock property database that they maintain, and actually the, the NRCAN supported um, making that more accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, so I presume that's part of you understand about that? Yes, I know about it. Yeah. But this is, we were trying to get our data at the door within our server. So then the rock properties were with the geophysical data sets together. Yeah. But a lot of that has um, in situ logs and supposedly mm -hmm. publicly available. I don't know what the arrangements are these days, but yeah. One of the points with your geoscience is that you could an analyze that data in a continuous whole and average the data and so forth. It was cer certainly John McBody's mm -hmm. intent to be able to do that sort of thing. So that would be a value mm -hmm. to Canada. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right now, but it's not We'll get there eventually. Todd, did you have a... I just want to add something for the uh, beta GDX. This paper, Evaluating Normalized Magnetic Derivatives for Structural Mapping, uh, J.D. Fairhead, S.E. Williams, I don't have a year on it, mm -hmm. but if you look for that paper, it's one of several papers that talk about tilt, GDX, beta, yeah, my, some of my colleagues put together, uh, Mark Pilkington and Pierre Keating have several papers comparing that say exactly what the source architectures are and essentially where they're redundant with each other. Um, just on the, on the general nature of pre-competitive data, I mean, what Vicky was talking about, you know, they get a uh, fly something based on provincial or territorial issues and the, and the jurisdictions in those, but we, I was in a meeting uh, a couple of days ago with, with your boss, Mike, and, you know, the survey has choices, there's a lot of things when budgets aren't that high as to what they spend money on, so I encourage you, and maybe through the PDAC, to, they have a geoscience committee, my colleague Charles Baudray is the director of that, that, that the voice should be made for the continuation of the building up of pre-competitive data, largely through state provincial organizations. Uh, just don't assume that because it's been done in the past, it's going forward without expressions of interest, and, and those, are, those are very helpful. And like Vicki yourself sits as one of the few people doing what she does in the survey. It's not like we invited one out of 50. We're talking like one out of three, I think, is sort of would that be fair? <laughs> so, and that's for the government of Canada, and there's almost no such activity sitting down inside the provinces, unfortunately. We're not nearly as advanced in that sort of tasking good professionals to work on those data sets. But at least if we get the data, it's a starting point, and there's
there's lots, obviously, as Vicki showed, can be done with that. And then, of course, the exciting part is when explorers get take the next step and start drilling those holes in those hole structures and looking at those protozoic rocks that may have some deposits. Anyways, thanks again.